Hello and welcome to Outlaw Bookseller with me, Stephen e. Andrews, writer, bookseller, collector, and I'm about to head off into Bath, where tonight I'm attending, I may even be emceeing and doing the Q&A and the interview, an event with Adrian Tchaikovsky and Lauren Bukas. How exciting! And with me will be the occupier, who, as you know, does quite a bit of the music on the channel, so we'll see what comes out of it. Hello Tara, you're Hello. doing the event here tonight with Adrian Tchaikovsky and Lauren Bukas and you do lots of events here don't you? I do, yes. You do, yes, including, let's see, Adult Book Club? I do, I run the Fiction Book Club. Absolutely, yeah. And um, is this your first SF event? You know what, I think it is, surprisingly. I think it is as well. I've yeah. done loads of different events, but yeah, yeah first, absolutely. first one I've got, I've got my little bar. I can see, yeah, it's up. very beautiful, very, very beautiful indeed. So we've got all sorts of drinks here and things. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent stuff. When one prepares for a event to do a hosting, what do I do? Well, of course, one reads the books. So I have advanced copies here. There we go. And one makes notes, of course. There we are as prompts and one engages the brain and really that's it because it's really just about enjoyment and sort of asking questions and giving the, the authors an opportunity to talk. So you can ask the right sort of questions to get the balance between, how can we put it, the interrogative to get them talking and also to interject things which they might not expect to get them going in a different direction. So that's a big part of it. Turn your mobile phones off. If you want to take pictures, I'm sure that's probably okay. With you. Yeah, no, please take pictures. We will not be publicity shy, but otherwise, just turn your phones off and silent whatever you do. Um, that would be great. <laughs> because, as Alfred North Whitehead said, it is the business of the future to be dangerous. And Whitehead was a mathematician and philosopher, and you know that is why science fiction is so interesting. Because as we become more technologically advanced, the risks seems sometimes to outweigh the benefits. But tonight we have two of our top SF writers in the world. My name is Steve Andrews, I'm the author of the book 100 Must Read Science Fiction Novels, and I run the YouTube channel Outlaw Bookseller. And I'm delighted tonight to introduce, as a two of our finest authors. We have, we'll do ladies first. We have the very wonderful Lauren, Lauren Bukas, that's the correct pronunciation, isn't Rise it? Rise with mucus. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you will see that on the internet. Um, and Lauren has had a long and distinguished career as a journalist, comics writer, novelist. She's done everything. She really has. And she is probably best known to the mass media world as the author of The Shining Girls, which of course has been an Apple TV series. And this was a big breakthrough book for her. Some of her earlier books had a claim from the beginning, from the likes of William Gibson, not to be sniffed at. And we're very really glad to have Lauren here tonight. So if you could give her a big hand, please. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about her new book, Bridge. You can't have this one, because this is a paper advanced copy, but there's a very beautiful hardcover that you can buy if you like. And we have some of her paperbacks already. There are some of you who already bought, bought them all, which is great. And not least by any means, we have one of Britain's most popular SF writers who has really brought things like world building and pantropy, evolutionary SF back into the game big time over the last 20 years. He started writing fantasy novels. I don't think this man ever sleeps. He's written a huge number of books. 
I've read, I think, six, and I'm enjoying them all seeing tonight. We're going to be talking about his new book, Alien Clay. Again, you will only get a hardcover, and it's very beautiful, decorated end papers. So without further ado, another round of applause, please, for our guest. Okay, one of the beauties of science fiction is that it does something which hardly any other literature does, which is that part of its core function is to install something called cognitive estrangement in your mind, which is to make you go, what, what is going on? What is this about? And that is one of the things which really separates it and helps it move literature forward. So we'll talk about the two books and we'll try and put some shape on and ask some specific questions. So I'll ask Adrian some penetrating ones first of all. And just very, very brief, and you'll get an idea of the plot. Alien Clay is set in the future where Earth has become dystopian and is run by an authority called the Mandate. And they're not very nice and they're very keen on sending political prisoners to other worlds, which they hope to colonize one day. And that's the basic scenario. And our narrator of Alien Clay is an academic who may well have said the wrong things. And um, would you say that sums up the, uh, the sort of opener, as it were? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And what I liked about the book is that it incorporates quite a number of classic SF tropes. It has the dystopian one, it has planetary exploration, it has biology. And it, it really sort of is a rip-roaring read. It's just under 400 pages. And you go on this journey with the central character, Ayrton, who goes to a planet called Kiln. And that's Kiln on the surf on the Yakama, which is very beautiful. But it's not actually very beautiful when you're there, is it? And the mandate, the thing that fascinated me about the mandate and about this dystopian authority who is sending people off to other worlds, is that they, like all totalitarians, they, they know they're right. They know they're absolutely right and they have a mandate. So we can see how, of course, in politics, we get this thing where people have voted and they get the mandate. Well, this is the one and only mandate. And they're very big on orthodoxy. And that really struck a chord with me, because I think we live in a time where we're all wondering what we should say, what we can say, what we can't say. And was getting across this idea of orthodoxy through the mandate a big sort of message that you wanted to work with and go forward from? Yeah, so it's one of, one of the things we're seeing a great deal just you know, right now in the real world is an awful lot of sort of thought structures which have a, you know, a genuine practical use in themselves. I mean, and the one that is used most in the book is just the scientific method and scientific thought, kind of bent and twisted to post facto support the end result that people want. And this is kind of how the mandate works. So their idea, you know, the universe is organized in a certain way. It is organized in a certain way so that it's going to produce humans and humans are going to produce the mandate and that is the order of things that cannot be questioned. Um, and, but the weird thing about human thinking is that's never enough. You always then need to try and provide proof. Uh, dictators are profoundly insecure. They, I mean, they basically know that they don't really have a right to be there. So they want scientists to tell them, yes, science says you are the genetically superior type of person who is allowed to lord it over everyone else. They want um, religious figures to tell them, yes, you are. You have a divine right to rule these people. You are, you are meant to be there. Um, the idea that they can just do it through main force is never enough for people, even when they think that they can. And so the mandate is built on this huge, this colossal sort of pyramid of everyone having to construct a single universal theory of why the mandate is supposed to be in charge. And that's the thing that Artem Dardet has, um, has been quietly questioning back on Earth, and because he's surrounded by informers of this whole kind of police state, that is what's got him set for the extra solar labor camps. Yeah. Because what, what I picked out in the book, which was really interesting, was the idea that the mandate were a necessary part of the evolution of the universe. And that brought into my mind, and I'll try not to stumble as I say it, so I don't quite understand it, but it's always fascinating to me, the physics idea of the anthropic cosmological principle which is the universe is the way it is because we are here now at this stage of evolution. <laughs> and that was fascinating. And of course, what they're doing with orthodoxy is they're, the people who won't count out, they're sending off these planets and they, they go to kill them. And the penal colony narrative has been 
a classic, a classic part of fiction for as long as there's been penal colonies. If we think of the origins of Australia, for example, and if you look at the history of SF, there are notable examples of penal colonies. And two of the ones which come to my mind were Farewell and Spliss by G.G. Compton, which is an amazing old book, and a book called Hawksville Station by Robert Silverberg, where people are sent back in time to the Cambrian period with their prisoners. And this very much wasn't sort of coming behind this, but it's very much in that tradition that you've added this whole Orwellian thing as well, which is plays its part very much with the academics. And I used to run a university bookshop, and I found that academics did what they liked, so their character determined what they did, and they were allowed to do it. And of course, that's great for intellectual freedom, but the mandate really don't like that sort of thing, do they, at all? So it was the moral message in the book which I felt was very, very strong, which reminded me of Dogs of War. Can I ask how many people have read Dogs of War? There's a fear, that's good. Uh, which is my favorite book by Andrew, and I'm sure you've all read Children of Time. Um, and the political thing, the way you did that with the entertainment factor was just so strong. So something that comes up in the book as well is the power of collective action. And could you expand a bit on that for us in terms of the plot and how that infects the book? Um, yes, so I mean, there are two strands to the book. So the collective action, as far as um, Arton is concerned, is basically he despairs of the, the resistance, any kind of resistance, ever really getting together and making a proper unified go at the mandate because there are always informants. Someone has always been turned, someone is always, uh, always on the payroll, or they catch someone and brutalize them until they give the names of all of their confederates. And so the idea of just getting together and trusting other people enough to have to make any kind of serious attempt at overthrowing the mandate seems to be absolutely impossible. And then on Kill, he's confronted with an ecosystem that is 100% collective action because it's rather than competitive Darwinism, the ecosystem is entirely built in symbiosis. So each what appear to be individual creatures. They are collectives of various bits and pieces that can then go their own way and get together in different configurations to make completely different creatures, uh, which you can imagine, as you can imagine, is driving the scientific team on, on kill complete despair, because it really doesn't turn into anything where you can make it agree with mandate possible. Sorry, Rob, did you want to... I, I did actually want to jump in, um, which is that, you know, I grew up in South Africa under the apartheid regime, yeah, cool. where there was a lot of, like, you know, trying to justify racism through science and that kind of thing, but actually there was an analogy I just remembered, which was really interesting, which ties into science fiction and the power of science fiction and the power of story, which is the, in the 80s, there was a TV series V about the aliens, yeah. um, and I think it was a five-part miniseries, and it was in a prime time slot at, like, 5, 7 p.m. on a Wednesday, which is when MacGyver and Annie McBeal, and you know, that's when that was that was the slot. And it suddenly went to late night. Um, and uh, so instead of every Wednesday, suddenly it went Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 11 p.m., done. And my mom recorded it for me, which I really appreciated. But I said to her, I was like, why did they ban this TV show? And she said, well, you know, they had freedom fighters, and that's a big problem because the people in the struggle fighting against apartheid were called freedom fighters. Now I remember this, and I, I was giving a talk, and I was like, that can't be true, that's, that's really dumb, because the dictators, it turns out, are really dumb. Um, <laughs> and, there, and, I, and I asked around a, a South African journalist who was uh, now in his 60s, but you know, he, he remembered the story, he was like, no, 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 it was worse than that. Because if you ever watch the TV show V, the aliens come down, and they are eventually revealed to be reptiles, and they peel off their faces, and they're there to eat the humans. Um, but our president at the time, his nickname was the Big Crocodile. He was a crocodile. <laughs> and he was so vain, he thought the show was about him. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's an incredible power in, in analogy and science fiction as a way of kind of exploring big ideas, but also in that dictators are really dumb and won't try to use anything to justify their Powerful POV. Yeah. We could probably name quite a few of them now, couldn't we? This is the thing with, 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 with great ease. And um, it's, it's that whole thing about metaphor. Um, Samuel R. Delaney said that some people couldn't read science fiction because they couldn't make the world fit together, that cognitive thing, because the language. You get things like, if you take the um, phrase, um, she turned on her left side, 
Now, in most novels, that'd be somebody rolling over in bed. In science fiction, it could be flicking a switch and her world exploded. I mean, that could be an emotional metaphor. In science fiction, it could be literally true. And that's, that's an interesting thing. So that in itself, SF is a revolutionary form that attracts metaphoric thinking and revolutionary ideas. And if you think of writers like, say, the Strugatsky brothers in Russia who had to write their SF novels under Soviet communism, you know, it's, it's a very subversive thing, and that's why it's an important thing. So really, what I loved about this was the balance of all these elements and the way that they move together. And there's, there's a certain amount of body horror as well. People love body horror, don't they? You know, so if you like body horror, you love this. And there's an affinity with your other work. I mean, there were certainly affinities with Cage of Souls, I felt, um, with the penal colony, and certainly with Children of Time, um, because the evolutionary aspect. So do you feel that, you know, there's this theory about art, isn't it? A lot of artists have one theme, and they circle around it, and they do it from different angles. Um, do you see your own work that way, or, or are there lots of other things to explore? I said, uh, there are certainly ideas that once I've had a go at, I'm kind of left thinking, actually, there is another angle. Yes. There is another place I could have taken that, where, yeah, which explores different areas and raises other questions. So, yes, I'm, I'm kind of aware that um, there are some framing devices and some ideas that are now recurrent in my work. But, yeah, there are 50 plus books out there, so I'm hoping that's, that's forgivable. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's, gen it's just, it's generally just the stuff that really interests me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's, a, there's a lot of different things in this book, and there's a few things particularly. I mean, something I know you've described um, the book as is Persephone in reverse. So, can you enlighten us on that? Sure, I think, you know, uh, so Bridget's mom has died, um, and when she was a kid, uh, her mom used to bring up this thing called the dream room, which she told her would let her experience other worlds and other realities. It would let you do kind of a freaky Friday body swap across realities with your alternate universe self, um, who maybe already has the perfect life and everything you ever wanted. And she, come, she came to understand that was part of her mom's brain cancer and her epilepsy. She had years of therapy, but you know now in the opening chapter of the book, here's the damn dream room, and it works. But her mother's just died. And she has all these unanswered questions, especially around this kind of very weird childhood. And maybe in one of these other universes, her mother is still alive, and she can kind of resolve these issues and like, find out exactly what was going on. Um, so I think there's a lot about grief. There's a lot about like being a mother and being a daughter, I think is kind of a recurrent theme in my work, especially. Um, but it is this kind of like trying to, you know, have a last chance to say goodbye, a last chance to resolve things. Yeah. You know, she's finding Joe's diaries and like learning things about her mom she never knew. And I think we never really know our parents. Um, and that was an interesting thing for me to play with and kind of explore. Yeah, yeah. So the Persephone thing is really like the Greek myth where Hades takes Persephone into the underworld. Um, and Persephone's mother Demeter seeks to deal with this. But this is sort of like in reverse, yeah. you know, as you say. So there's the resonance of old stories as well as new ones. And um, something which is really big and zeitgeisty at the moment, and I know this gave you a certain amount of pain when you were finishing your book, was the concept of the multiverse. And anybody who's ever done anything creative, or you're doing something, then you discover somebody has done it. Because it's, it's nice to try and be original. It's very hard. The longer we have art, the longer we have mass media, the harder it is to be original. And I, I sort of felt for you when, uh, when, when you said that. But, because everything yeah. everywhere all at once is already the perfect mother-daughter multiverse story, <laughs> and mine is the second best. <laughs> Thank God it came out when I was in edits, because yeah. I actually would have abandoned it. I don't think you should worry, because I mean, the, the term multiverse was, I think it was coined by J.B. Priestley, I'm sure probably everybody who had to do inspect calls in school, I know I did, and I hated it, I saw loads and loads of years. But I mean, Michael Moorcock, he was using the multiverse for a big term, 60s, 70s, and Mike's 83. We, we did events here with him many years ago. Uh, so, you know, you shouldn't feel bad about it. But as you say, it's become a real thing, hasn't it? So, you know, how do you, how do you cope when, um, when something becomes a real thing? You know it's there, and it gets so big all of a sudden. You don't care. <laughs> I think that's the best. You just, you just write the stories you want to write. You know, yeah. when I, my yeah. first novel was Marcyland, yes. and, um, and I was halfway through writing it, and I read Oryx and Craig. And I was like, oh, well. <laughs> 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 
and it's bloody Margaret. Why bother? But yeah. you know, and it's bloody Margaret Atwood, you know, yeah. and and she's brilliant and she's amazing and and I really thought about giving up. But you know, you as a storyteller, you have an original voice and you have different things to say. And I was coming from a very South African perspective, and that was fine. Um, and also, William Gibson liked you which he's never said much about Mark Dutch. <laughs> and he lives in Canada. So I, I think yeah. you come out the top anyway. So. <laughs> you did a lot of research in the book into parasites. It's sort of fascinating stuff about parasites. And again, so we've got a bit of body horror for those of you who like that. That's the thing as well, isn't it? And of course, I think of body horror, and I think of David Cronenberg, who was the two of his first to fly to, and he made a film back in the late 70s called Shivers, which is also known as the Parasite Movies. But some of your Parasite stuff is absolutely brilliant. So tell us about what you discovered about Parasites. It's, it's great. I love Parasites. Um, sorry. Um, you, you heard it <laughs> I, so one of my favorite things doing is research. It's a great way to avoid writing, which is my least favorite thing in the world. Um, so, you know, I, I tried to do a lot of research, and for this book I interviewed a lot of interesting people, uh, neuroscientists, musicologists, because of course the way that the dream worm works is that you take the dream worm um, like a drug, and then you watch a video or a zoetrope, um, and you play a resonant musical instrument like a sitar, where the notes between the notes open the doors between the worlds. Um, so I interviewed lots of people and talked a lot about that, and it was really fun to do. Um, and then I got to Parasites. And I'm not saying the dream worm is a parasite, uh, it's a theory which is floated in the book, but I went to go to an interview, uh, my housemate was dating someone who was a neuroparasitologist, she was doing her PhD on tapeworm as the leading cause of epilepsy in Africa. And it usually takes place about five to ten years after infection. Um, it's when you interrupt the life cycle, so you accidentally swallow the lava, they get into the bloodstream, they get into your brain, they die. And five to ten later, five to ten years later, you develop epilepsy. And she was trying to figure out why. She has not figured out why, but um, but I got to spend the day with her, hanging out in her lab. She's very sweet and very geeky, and she's got like pink hair, and she teaches at the College of Magic in Cape Town, and she's just a total dork, and she's just fire breathing, and then she does parasites. And I spent the whole day in her lab chatting with her, and we like mushed up the tapeworm, and then she like injected it into the confocal, using the confocal microscope into a slice of rat brain. It was just all really amazing and really cool. And at the end she said, um, oh, do you want, do you want a slice of rat brain to take home? <laughs> so you naturally said yes. And I said yes! <laughs> and she was like, she was quite taken aback. She wasn't expecting me to say yes. <laughs> and she was like, oh, oh, okay. And she went off and she got me a slice of rat brain. And um, it's obviously called Pinky. Um, uh, thank you, that's like a piece of snot on a slide, very dry and desiccated, no actual tapeworm infection. I don't know if I was allowed to bring Pinky when I immigrated to the UK, but let's not talk about that too much. Um, yeah, so it was, it was just a really fun day, like, to spend that time with her and, like, to talk about it, but I read multiple books on parasites, you know, obviously Cordyceps is the one, uh, you know, everyone's in love with, and in The Last of Us, and Mike, uh, Mike Carey's amazing book, The Girl with All the Gifts, and the movie that he wrote as well. But toxoplasmosis is my favourite. Um, yeah, that's an interesting one because I've only come across toxoplasmosis in the film version of Train Spotting, where I think if you've seen Train Spotting, one of the characters um, contracts HIV and he dies of toxoplasmosis. And um, you've discovered some interesting things about toxoplasmosis, which. So the science is a bit iffy, but yeah. uh, you know, there was this wonderful book on parasites, which I cite in my um, uh, bibliography at the end. Uh, but. There's a Czech uh, researcher who believes that toxoplasmosis can account for different behaviors in humans. So what happens in toxoplasmosis, it normally infects rats, and it makes the rats fearless of cat urine, and they run towards cats so they get eaten, and then the cat eats them, and then uh, you know, the life cycle continues. But there are some theories about toxoplasmosis. Again, there's not a lot of hard science on this, that it could affect human behavior, that it makes women more nurturing, and men more aggressive, and this Czech researcher believes that he can trace toxoplasmosis infection based on how many car accidents and road rage incidents there are in particular areas. It might also account for cultural differences and why some cultures were more warlike and invasive, um, and also might explain schizophrenia in poets in Paris in the, I think, the 1800s. That would make sense. Yeah, because they, they, that's when they started keeping cats. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. So, so if you have a cat, and I do have cats. Yeah, it's the cat in train spot. You yes. Get on the kit. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. So you get it from cat litter. Yeah. Um, so, so wash your hands. Yeah, there you go. This is interesting because, of course, 
we have this ongoing debate in society of nature and nurture, don't we? Of um, is it sociology or is it biology? Where I think you get to a certain age and you think it's a, it's a bit of both, and, and that is fascinating. And this is the sort of thing that these books draw out: is the biological things, which sometimes we forget in there. So we get very excited about spaceships and um, singularities and um, you know collapse our jumps and things like that. But biology is, is a really fertile area. Because even though we know so much, we, we still know so little as well. And I, I loved all that stuff. I think the thing that's also interesting is that I'm not interested in the definitive answers. So I can't tell you what the dream world is. There are a lot of theories in the book. Um, and there are certain consequences and there are certain rules, um, which I will very strictly adhere to. And then sit and have to backwards engineer and make sure everything is consistent. Um, but yeah, I, I'm much more interested in kind of intuitively like allowing that to expand. And I think what's also interesting is that we don't know the answers in the real world. You know, what happens after we die? Don't know. We've got theories, but we don't, none of us definitively know. And I think that's more interesting to me than having definitive answers without letting it just be vague and more and inconclusive. Yeah, I mean, this is something I was saying last time, just you always do get the sense that there is a whole real thing there that is just, it's just, as, as I think is essential for world building, it is simply that it is so much bigger than the book that the book is just giving you this little window on it but there is a yeah, I mean, there is it, in breach there is such a fascinating universe you just feel around the edges of any more questions at all yeah okay. and you're just the subjects of bridge you're talking about a substance which allows someone to transfer between one reality and the next it just put me in mind of um, vert by jeff noon have you read that um, so, yes, I, I wrote the introduction to the, I think it was the 20th anniversary edition. Mm. It was the first time I'd reread it in many years, and I realized that Marxie Land was essentially Vert fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> you see, that, that's the funny thing, there is this sense of conversation between books. And Absolutely. I, when I first read Vert, I thought, I read all this in the Joe Cornelius novels in the 60s, but, you know, times change, and, and these tropes and metaphors, they evolve to tie in or not in an interesting way with the way the world is. And this is the conversation of literature. And it's something we said about not changing the world. One of the big things in theories of SF is something called conceptual breakthrough. And if you, you can structure a perfect science fiction model, and the theory is that at the end there'll be one word, I've seen it done with one character, one sentence or a paragraph, where everything's turned on its head and a new paradigm, a new way of looking at the world opens up. But very often, of course, that doesn't have to be for everybody. It can be just for one person. And there's a wonderful example of that in Philip K. Dick's Galactic Party, in which your expectations are turned on their head in one word. And we all experience books in different ways. And that's the beauty of it. It's that conversation again between the reader and the writer. And I'm sure you guys have found that often when you talk to people, the readers, they've seen things or interpreted things that you know, you it's my so favourite thing is yeah. when somebody points something out to me but just to continue that, like the other thing is that the TV show, The Peripheral came out, mm. and you know I'd read the book when it came out and then the TV show is basically going to an alternate universe, it's not quite an alternate universe self, it's like kind of you know a, um, a VR kind of uh, robot self but I'm like, oh, damn it um, <laughs> but it's fine, you know like ideas ideas first of all are cheap um, and also ideas are, they're malleable and we are in conversation. We're all in conversation constantly with the world, with other stuff that we've read. And I think that's the magic of books. And I think that's, you know, sometimes people think that they have a relationship with me because they've had a relationship with my book. And I'm like, no, it happened in, I wasn't even there. Like it happened, <laughs> it happened entirely in your head between you, you and the book and everything you are and everything you've read, you brought to that experience. And that's been so magical and, and amazing. So. I think we're out of time now. We're going to hand you back over to the team here. I just want to say before we give a big hand to the guest authors tonight, could you put your hands together please for Rhys, Tara and Maylan, um, because it's hard work doing this sort of thing and they really go for it and they've done a brilliant job and I've just rocked up on my day off and just get to chat there for me and, and talk to her, which is just nice. So thanks to the team you always do. <laughs>
You're fantastic, don't worry. <laughs> So Mela. Yes, hello. That's, this is your event. You've done it all. Oh, right. Yes, it was a good time. Did you enjoy that? I did. It was yeah, really, really great. good. Well, I think you yeah. did a fantastic job. Well, I think you did a fantastic job. Well, we try. Yeah, we try. Yeah. But thanks for having me along. And um, it's great to see the guys and everything. Yeah. And um, <laughs> everybody seemed to enjoy it very much, which it's is fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And thank you as well, Tara. <laughs> what a team. <laughs>